Hello everybody, my name is Etienne Caron. I'm a GDE, uh, Android GDE from Montreal, Canada, um, Quebec, because there's Montreals elsewhere on the planet. Uh, I'm very passionate about VR, so today I'm absolutely not talking about anything Intel related, at least that I know of for now, unless they come out with a headset, which would be probably awesome, but who knows. Anyway, so when I started making cardboard apps, uh, I had a lot to learn. I wanted to avoid using Unity 3D because I was more of a Java C guy. I didn't know that much about OpenGL. Um, so things kept breaking when I changed little details, had to redo the build all the time. It was, it was pretty painful and a slow slog, so I kind of got annoyed with it. Uh, but I wasn't also a very sensible person, so I kept going, and I'd like to share with you what I found out, so perhaps you'd avoid the annoyances and the little pain points I ran into. All right, so there we go, clicker works. So we're going to start with a little bit of OpenGL theory. So just to get a, a, a cue, who here has played around with OpenGL a little bit? All right, good crowd. So some of this stuff is going to be very obvious. But I kind of feel that half the crowd probably hasn't played that much with it, so it's going to have some value. I'll try to keep it short. Um, so the big ecosystem slide. So people need to understand a few things about OpenGL. Uh, so one of the first things that OpenGL, the base standard, is for desktops. On mobile, we're talking about OpenGL ES. So very early mobile devices only had OpenGL ES 1.0, uh, which was a non-programmable uh, OpenGL pipeline. We'll see what that's about in a few minutes. 2.0 brought modern OpenGL into uh, the mobile uh, world. Um, so OpenGL ES 2.0 started with API 8. 3.0 was provided with API 18. And uh, Lollipop brought us OpenGL ES 3.1, plus something called the Android Extension Pack. Um, so the Android Extension Pack actually is fairly interesting. So it allows you to get basically almost the full power of the desktop OpenGL versions in Android. The thing is, though, that that one is not really all that supported yet. Um, as far as I know, mostly NVIDIA devices use it. The NVIDIA Android devices are pretty cool. So the TV, Shield TV, I believe, has it. And uh, most of their tablets also support it. Uh, so you might remember the rivalry demo that was showed off at Google I.O. 2014, so that was based on, on that framework, right? Um, so the future of the ecosystem, it's all going to be about OpenGL ES 3.2, which is going to bring in a lot of new features, and something called Vulkan. Now that was actually announced, uh, I think, in end of August at the last SciGraph conference. So what's exciting here is that if you've heard of uh, iOS's Metal, where you get a lot more access to your GPUs and your, your, your graphic pipeline. Vulkan is going to bring that to Android for us. So as far as I know, there's a few uh, Google engineers working on it. It's a cross-industry uh, you know, cross effort. Um, I'm not personally expecting to see much out of that until probably next spring, maybe next summer. Um, so, but it's kind of nice to know what's on the horizon, right? So what that's going to bring, actually, is a lot more configurability. You're going to be able to really know what's on the devices, tweak things as you want. So that should be an interesting thing. Right, so at this point, if you've never played with all this stuff, it might be a bit confusing. Uh, the key takeaways are really that we are going to be working with e OpenGL ES 3.1. And most of what we talk about here applies for OpenGL ES 2.0, which is most of the devices out there, right? The goal of the talk is more to give you a way to prototype nice VR environments. So that's why we focus on something a bit forward-looking. Uh, it gives us features that allow us to do a few interesting things. All right, so the minimum effective dose of geometry, math, and core 3D concepts. So we're going to try to keep it short, but it's important that you grasp the basics to understand half of what I'm going to be saying. Um, right, so your space. So 3D space, you use three uh, different variables, right? You use X, Y, and Z to position points in your space. Very simple stuff. <clears throat> a vertex is a set of a point in space using these coordinates, right? Uh, then vertices, obviously. <laughs> uh, something to understand, though, in, in computer graphics, when we talk about a vertex, we don't only talk about the actual coordinates of a point in space. In the context of OpenGL, a vertex also has other attributes. It can be stuff like color, 
uh, normals can be associated. We'll see what normals are in a second. So you have a lot of, you could even invent some new things. You could give it a temperature, a weight, and we'll see in the context of a programmable pipeline how that could be useful. Right. Another key thing to understand is that OpenGL assembles these vertices into primitives. So you can see that there's actually a lot of different OpenGL primitives out there. And the reason there's so many is primarily one for performance. Uh, we'll only be focusing today on GL triangles. They're a bit easier to work with, uh, and that has to do with how you build your data set and pass it into OpenGL. Uh, typically, if you want performance, you'd be playing with triangle strips and things like that because the amount of data that you're actually passing to OpenGL has a big impact on performance, and we'll see, we'll see that in a minute. All right. Uh, another thing uh, that's important to understand is that our models, which are made of these primitives, uh, will be always centered around the coordinate space around 0, 0, 0. So basically, if you want to define a cube, each of the vertices of the cube are going to be centered around the origin, right? Simple enough. So this brings us to transforms. So why do we define models around the origin? Well, the point is that we want to move our models uh, anywhere we want. And you want to apply your transformations on an object that's actually at the origin, right? If you want to apply, for example, a rotation, you tend to rotate your object and then translate it. But the other thing to understand about transforms is that the order is very important, right? So if you translate then rotate, you can see in the, in the, on the right that you get a very different result than if you first rotate an object and then place it. Uh, also, there's a question of linear algebra. Um, uh, so you might not necessarily remember all your linear algebra if you don't actually use it in a day-to-day -day basis. I know most people don't uh, back home. Uh, so uh, the thing to understand, though, is that most of the work is going to be done by the pipeline. So it's nice to have a refresher. I recommend everybody sort of get up to date on that stuff to understand what they're doing if they're going to play significantly with OpenGL. That's kind of a basic. So uh, obviously out there, there's Udacity, Khan Academy. They have very nice courses that you can run through. And if you've done those college courses or those university courses, you'll be sort of refreshed in a few, you know, in a few hours at the most. So it's probably a good uh, thing to do. All right, some more important concepts. I'm going to try to keep it short, but these are things that are like good to have clearly anchored in your mind before we move on. Projections and cameras. So you need to understand that when you configure an OpenGL pipeline, you have to set up rules of projection. So the first figure here is a good example. The idea is that we'll, we're going to tell how, but uh, knowing that things are far away or close is going to have an effect on how the perspective is going to be applied, right? Things that are very far away are going to be smaller. So you set up those rules. You can even set up rules in OpenGL where there's no perspective at all. That can lead to sort of a weird, huh? But you can play around with OpenGL and create 2D spaces as well that would have like superimposed shapes. So it's a very flexible type of, of, of a library. Uh, the other thing to understand, the second diagram shows, is that not only will we have to place our model in this 3D virtual world, but we'll also think about, we'll need to think about camera placement. That's very important, right? So we'll get back to it again, but understanding that placing a camera in our world is actually another layer of translations and rotations that will be applied to the, our objects in our world, in our scene. All right. So another super important concept to sort of have a good grasp of is lighting. So we're going to learn how to implement Lambertian reflectance. So Lambertian reflectance is named after Johann Heinrich Lambert, who introduced that concept in 1760 in his book Photometria. Obviously, we're going to try to keep all that stuff simple. And don't worry, you only really need to understand a couple of concepts. Uh, simple lighting, we can get away with uh, knowing two concepts, understanding that there's such a thing as ambient light which is the light that reaches the surface of your object after bouncing around everywhere else, right? You can sort of think of it as a low-level light that affects everything in a scene, right? So it's your minimum amount of, I see something. Then there's diffuse light, which is the light that reaches your eye directly after bouncing off a surface. So the amount of light that will reach your eye right, will vary for, with the angle between the surface of the object and the source of the light. So the way to calculate that angle is via Lambert's cosine law. We'll show how to sh 
calculate that later, but it's, it's super easy. It's a one-line uh, method call, you'll see. All right, so that leads us to normal, another concept that we need to understand. What is a normal? Uh, you probably, uh, most of you probably have a slight idea, but it's basically the, you know, it allows us to calculate our angles between our light source and our surfaces, right? So it's a vector that points perpendicularly, uh, sorry for that, <laughs> outward of our surface. Uh, it's a normalized vector, normalized because uh, we're only interested in calculating angle differences, so you only need to have a vector that's the size of one. All right, we're almost done with the theory. So here, I just want to point out the, a few things that you'll have to get familiar with when you look at GLSL code. So GLSL code is the actual code that you provide to OpenGL to program your pipeline. It's basically C, so it should be familiar enough for anybody that's done a good amount of Java. Uh, I'm showing here a structure. So just to establish a link, to be, a link between, say, our vertex that has this information here is like position, normal, color, and a texture. And while in Java, we're going to have an array of floats. These are going to be converted on, uh, in the OpenGL pipeline to those uh, structures, VEC3, VEC4s, and VEC2s. So they're all vectors, so it's fairly abstract when you're talking about GL. All right. So this, this is the full GL pipeline. Uh, that's not going to speak to you a whole lot if you're just starting out. Uh, so we're going to focus on an abstracted version of all of this. Uh, first concept that's kind of interesting for app developers to grasp, I think it's kind of important, you have to look at OpenGL as if basically you had a client-server architecture. And the parallel is as follows. When you're in CPU land, right, you're doing your things, you're kind of close by, you're in one thread. Uh, somebody buzz, I hope it's on my phone. Here, sorry, I'm going to try to ignore that. Uh, right. So one of the big pieces of the puzzle here to understand about performance is that when you pass data into the GPU, passing that data is very similar to actually uh, sending out... Uh, sorry, I'm just going to check. If this is terrible. I got it. This is... Not pleasant. All right, thank you. Sorry, I was getting distracted. Okay, back. Right, so the thing to think about is that whenever you pass data to the GPU, that's actually an expensive uh, process. So just think of it as if you were sending a request over the net to your server, right? Think of your client as your Java code and your server code as the pipeline itself. It's simple as that, right? Uh, the other thing here is that performance actually really, really matters. Right, so the communication between the layers being the place that your, perf, uh, your frame rate will take a hit, you want to keep that very simple. And in VR, uh, you need to absolutely hit that 60 frame per second. Like actually, the Oculus Rift was designed to do 70 frames per second just to keep the realism high enough so that VR would be compelling. So we're already starting with a handicap, so here you need to be absolutely careful about how much you know, uh, frame rate you, you manage to get. All right. Brief version of the OpenGL pipeline. How, how does this thing work? So the color coded here is the important part. Like everything that's blue is really IO and state. So this is where we're actually taking all our vertic vertices, all the information associated with it, passing it into the GPU, into the pipeline. Second step here, the vertex step, is the first programmable part. So everything in yellow on this diagram is, is a programmable uh, step in the pipeline. So this is the place where you're going to transform all your, all your vertices and you're going to project them onto the screen, and you're going to apply the operations that you need to apply, so your rotations, your translations, your camera placement. All that math that has to do with the points in space is happening at that step. The step after that, the green one, uh, the greens are fixed stages of the pipeline. So that's where the actual uh, primitive assembly is taking place. So that's where we take the vertices and turn them into actual triangles projected on screen. The next step after that is the fragment step. So actually, that program is only responsible for painting pixels on the screen. So what happens is that once you have your vertices projected onto the screen, you know where your triangles are. So the next step is to decide what color are each of the pixels of these triangles. So we're going to see what we can do with that. That's going to be fairly interesting. There's a lot of tricks you can apply to that step. The last step, as you'd expect, is where all the compositing is happening. So if you have multiple layers, they're brought together, the alpha is calculated. The final thing is, is all done and pushed into the GL surface view, which is back in Android land at this point. So that's where the pipeline feeds back 
bitmaps basically back to uh, CPU. All right. So being clear about how you move from 3D space to screen space, again, has to do with those two steps, the vertex step and the fragment step in your pipeline. So that little diagram is just to really bring that home. You have your vertices in 3D space, your vertex shader works on that, turns the, those into screen coordinates, and then the fragment shader using those screen coordinates will calculate colors for your shapes. All right, so small slide just to express the power of parallel processing. So for those of you that are not aware, I think most people are dimly at some level aware of how these things work on, if you work in Android or any type of computing nowadays. GPUs are massively parallel, right? So the idea is that the scripts, the GLSL scripts and the programmable steps of our pipeline are all executing in parallel for each frame being rendered onto the screen, which leads to very fast performance. So this is how you can actually write a program that will be potentially executed for every pixel in your screen. If you calculate how many pixels are on the screen, that's a ton. And GPUs are the, the thing that makes this actually possible, right? To calculate colors for every single thing. Okay, so next step. Actual OpenGL practice. So this is the part where we're going to actually talk a bit more about what it takes on Android to actually do uh, 3D. Uh, very, very vanilla Android OpenGL. Fairly simple stuff. So you need to be aware of uh, the, the idea that you have a draw frame command that's going to be called for each frame being rendered onto the screen. And the on-surface change and on-surface create you see in the diagram here are the methods being called whenever a uh, screen is actually displayed, right? So these are going to be called whenever your activities is, uh, you know, brought back to life, right? So that's where your life cycle kind of gets back into the story. Uh, threading is an important thing. So as Android developers, we all know about the UI thread, right? The main thread. Uh, well, and with OpenGL, you actually get an extra thread. So you have an actual GL render thread for the surface where you're going to be rendering those pixels. So that kind of makes things slightly more complicated. Uh, just to be aware of this, like typically what you would do to communicate with that render thread is to call a queue event with a runnable and from the UI thread. So that would queue the runnable to be run on the GL thread whenever time was available. Very similar to what you do with the UI thread, but you just have to be aware that there's actually two out there. Now the actual cardboard SDK. It's not that much more complicated. So if, you, if you've actually done OpenGL examples on Android, you just need to bring out the Cardboard SDK and uh, you have an extra activity, the Cardboard activity, which is going to be responsible for setting up the SDK for you. It's actually very simple to implement. Now, all of this, by the way, I'm not showing a ton of code. There's a little bit of code, but there's uh, going to be a link to my GitHub where I have all the sample code for this talk. So you can actually go out and try the things I'm going to be showing you later. Um, so, uh, the other thing to note, there's a cardboard view, so that's your typical view, as you'd expect. And under that view, there's something called the stereo renderer. This is where most of your code is going to be living. This is where you implement a few extra methods. But basically, if you look at uh, this class diagram, all you're getting extra is uh, method calls for each eye, right? That makes sense. We're going to be trying to do stereoscopy. Um, you might note that there's a little bit of libs down there, so we're still working with uh, the jars. Uh, you have to get the SDK, take the jars and put them in your project. It's not yet uh, a Gradle dependency. Um, also, something I've discovered with my new phone is that uh, some of the code in there is not built against ARM v8, so that won't work on Nexus's 5X and up for now. So, you know, important thing to note. Uh, typically, next up, I explain how to set up the GL pipeline. I'm going to skip that step because that's going to put us way over time. I think I'm already running long. Uh, again, just go see uh, the code for that's going to be for the, the code that's at this link below for that. And I also went into detail at my uh, version one of this talk that I gave at Big Android Barbecue a few weeks ago. That one is on uh, YouTube, and the links to that uh, actual talk are uh, in, the, in the project itself. Right, so basic lighting. We talked about lighting. We have an idea how it works. Uh, light is actually super critical in OpenGL, right? Because otherwise, you have no idea what your points of references are. So we want to turn this cube into this, right? So how to do this at the very minimum level. Uh, so this is our first sample code for an actual shader. 
So this is a vertex shader. Um, so we're just going to show that. I just want to show this so that you understand how lighting basically works. I was you know, talking about this earlier. So uh, we need a light source. So we're hard coding in the shader, um, right? But uh, note how we apply the model view transform right below there. So the thing to grasp here is that we have our light source. We're going to have the vertex along with its normal, right? So using these two, we can calculate an angle between the two, right? And that angle with, is basically our Lambert factor. So it's, it's really just calculation of um, if you have light full on, then it's going to be full illumination. And if it's light that's very uh, from the side, then you're going to have less illumination and less light reaching your eyes. So that's what's going to decide what the shade of the face is, very simply. That's it. And you're done. So that's your basic lighting model. Once you understand this, you have to understand also that to do nice scenes, you're going to have to explore a little bit more. But for our purposes today, that's enough. All right, enough flat 3D. Let's do VR. What does it involve? It's actually very simple. So this is your activity layout. Nothing fancy, you just use the cardboard view full screen. Then after that, your main activity, or cardboard activity, is going to extend cardboard activity. And these three lines that are highlighted, all really you need to manipulate to get your cardboard uh, VR started. Uh, so, you know, if you look at when you turn on VR, this is what happens. The screen is split, and you get uh, your methods for the on-draw eye with slightly different camera angles being called. And that's all there is to it. Uh, typically, you can also set distortion correction, but in, uh, in our case for the sample code, it actually doesn't work. Um, the reason for that is that you can actually think of cardboard as a wrapper around your, op your own OpenGL pipeline, so it's actually quite easy to break cardboard if you have special configurations, which in our case we kind of do. So just a slight note, but uh, in most cases, lens distortion is not actually a big showstopper. It doesn't, you know, you won't really notice it in most cases unless you, know, you have a lot of uh, distortion in your lens. Um, so there's a bit of sample code here. I'm going to fly through it really because the big thing you have to understand is that the on draw eye method is going to be called with a slightly different angle, right? The camera is going to be placed differently for each eye. That's basically all you need to know. Um, there's a few calls there, but I'm just going to fly through these and just get to the good bits right now because I think everybody can look up at the code later. And if there's questions, I'll be happy to answer them after. So, live coding. Uh, what is live coding, right? The idea is that you get a very tight uh, refresh loop, right? So, uh, this is actually inspired by a talk by a guy called Brett Victor who uh, had this talk called Inventing on Principle. There's going to be a link to in my, there's a link in the GitHub project. Uh, I would definitely check it out. Uh, the guy had really big ideas, and basically what he's saying is that IDEs, well, it's a talk from a few years back, uh, but IDEs have not really evolved all that much since the beginning of computing, if you think about it. Like, you can't really see live what your code is going to give you. So to palliate that, uh, there's some approaches that we can use, and a lot of people have sort of been exploring that space. So just to get an idea of what kind of affordances we can get from a live coding development environment. Um, right, so here I'm actually, the sh so the code is kind of hard to see, but this is a fragment shader in a web page. So there's a lot of these uh, little projects out there. The link is below. If you visit that link, you actually get a full fragment shader in a browser that you can edit live and see what kind of things you can do with it. So in this case, I'm actually editing the color uh, variance based on the screen coordinates of the pixel we're painting. So you, know, you can very quickly see what's going on. And when you're just starting out with shaders, and it's kind of a new concept, being able to see live what happens is actually super powerful. It's going to be very, very helpful in you learning this new, uh, this new stuff. Um, so to have an actual similar capability in our own cardboard development loop, because as everybody knows, when you build an app on Android, it's a fairly slow thing. So if you're going to have to do this refresh cycle all the time and you're new at it and you're going to break that pipeline very often, it's going to be a very good thing if you have that a tool chain that allows you to get to a point where you really just type your code and see the results live. So how can we achieve that on Android? Um, the idea is that you have a base a viewer program that's running on the phone, and you try to pass everything else that's configurable and programmable at runtime over the air. 
So in, in our case, the first version of the tool chain I built was using uh, IntelliJ's node support. So I had, so I have, there's two different things to think about. There's the shaders themselves, which are actually fairly simple things. They're just big, a big string that you pass into an OpenGL pipeline. And that string is your actual C or GLSL code. Just pat that, pass that in. The, the pipeline actually compiles it. You can actually see the error messages that you're going to have if, if you do something wrong on the, on the log cat. And you fix those, and life is good. So that part of things is relatively simple. I used a, a web editor called Ace that allows me to have uh, syntax coloring and semi-decent editing tools in a browser. I added a little bit of, of code to publish these uh, edited shaders into Firebase. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with Firebase, Firebase is a, basically a publish subscribe model on, in the cloud. So it's a big JSON tree. You just publish your data into it and whoever subscribed to that data is going to get a live update. And that usually happens within the milliseconds. Uh, it's very, very quick if your network connection makes some sense. You'll also note that I'm not going to be doing any actual live coding here because the network obviously is not going to be my friend. Um, the other part of this to generate nice scenes is to have an actual geometry. So a geometry, for those of you that are familiar with OpenGL, you actually have geometry shaders in modern OpenGL on desktops, but we do not have that on mobile. So the way to palliate that loss is to simply create our own scripting language that will generate geometries potentially on the fly. So what my first approach was is I actually built a big data structure with all the geometry, all the vertices, and all their attributes I would push that into Firebase, and then I would push that to the actual viewers, right, to the actual units looking at it. Now, note with the diagram that nothing stops you from having 12 uh, or 100 different uh, viewers that are subscribed to the source of data. That's kind of interesting if you want to make experiments. Um, right. So at this point, the first version, I was only compiling the JS code in IntelliJ, sending the results over. V2 uh, now uses three different technologies. Well, you know, it uses Node, which we've talked about right now, but it also uses Gulp and Browserify. So if you're familiar with Node development, uh, what's interesting about Node is it brings package management, uh, you know, dependency style into JavaScript. So all you need to do is, is put a little require at the top of your JavaScript, and it acts like an include, and you suddenly have access to other libraries. Uh, so what's fun about Browserify is that it takes Node scripts and allows them to run in a browser. So this allows us to actually run, in, uh, run the scripts in our uh, Chrome uh, virtual uh, web view. Uh, not virtual, but you know, our web view. Uh, Gulp is a build system for JavaScript, which allows us to easily watch what's being edited in our project. And for each change into our JavaScript, it's rebuilt, then the result of that, the, uh, that build are pushed into Firebase. So when we now, instead of pushing, pushing geometry, we're going to be pushing scripts, actual programs that are going to execute on the device. That approach is a lot more flexible, and you can do basically anything you can think of and you know, have a much more interesting thing. So I have a small slide here that shows how you can actually reconfigure a pipeline live, because you might be thinking, oh, so we actually need to reconfigure that pipeline on the go. And it's actually not that hard. Very simple stuff, um, right? So shaders, how does that work? Uh, so we've talked about projected vertices, pixels. So we're going to look quickly at what a vertex shader looks like a bit more. Uh, in our case, we're using uh, a feature of OpenGL 3.1. So the example code cannot work on 3.0 for this specific purpose, for this specific reason. We're using iterative geometry. So what that allows us to do is if we create one shape, in our case, a cube, we can ask the pipeline to render that shape multiple times but using slightly different attributes. So what we can do is have the one cube, and we can make as many copies as we want and provide only things like rotation, color, placement in the scene that will change from one cube to the next. That actually keeps things super efficient because we only do one draw command on the pipeline to do one frame, which will allow us to keep actually a nice 60 frames per second on, say, something like a Nexus 5. All right. So what does this look like? So here's a bit more of the, uh, the demo aspect of things. So this is the basic environment I've just described. So on the left, you have your IntelliJ. And what we're doing at this step is actually, uh, this is the V2 example. So for each 
uncomment I'm doing and each shape being added in the scene, what's going on is I just save the script after each change when I'm interested in seeing on the device what's going to happen. Uh, top right, what we're looking at is Visor. Uh, if you're not familiar with Visor, it's basically VNC for Android. It's actually a very nice tool. The reason I'm not using GenuMotion, if there's anybody from GenuMotion, please start supporting OpenGL ES 3.1. Uh, you only support 2.0, so I can't do these examples. Uh, the slight problem here is actually that if you run cardboard on a phone for long enough, if you've tried it out, you probably know this, it's going to overheat and die very quickly. So typically I only have sessions of 30 minutes when I can start debugging and I have to put the phone on the recharge. It's kind of painful, but anyway, you get the idea. So this is a very nice environment, though. If you want to start experimenting, what happens is that you see your results live, right? And if you're going to screw up, you're going to find out right away. So that's kind of a, a, a nice approach. Uh, here I have a slide about deformations. I'm going to try, how much time do we have? Are we going to be over in, uh, what, we're good? Do we have another 10 minutes? Exactly. exactly. All right, that's good, we're good. All right, so very quick note on deformations. I just want to show people that there's a lot of tricks you can pull off with that pipeline when you start messing about with it. So this, for example, if you look at the slide, it's, a, it's an OpenGL, uh, it's a WebGL example and you can do deformations of your shape in a vertex shader. So being able to edit vertex shader, fragment shader live, and your geometry, you're gonna be able to play around and try out a lot of weird little techniques that are gonna you know, allow you to do fun things, like it's not very visible here, but if you go see that link, they manage to do actual uh, explosions with like a sphere. So it's, it becomes a, a fireball that explodes. And all you do is you put random, you randomize the distance of your points of your sphere from the center. It makes for very nice effects. And the powerful bit here is that if you start looking at these examples, you'll quickly realize there are about four or five lines of code. So there's a certain investment in understanding how to do things, but once you've passed that threshold and you have a live coding environment like the one I'm just showing here, you're going to be able to have a lot of fun. Uh, instead of having a lot of frustration at trying to understand what went wrong if you compile like multiple times. Uh, for fragment shaders, what can you do with a fragment shader? Or originally you'd do texture mapping, that would be your first sort of use case. You'd also calculate uh, the light in the scene, right? We showed off, so earlier what we showed off is a vertex shader doing lighting, but typically you don't just want your face to be all the same color, you'd like the face of your, sh of your cube, for example, to sort of reflect a bit better, like act, that actual point is at the actual distance from the light source at that actual angle, you're gonna get a very different effect. Uh, but texture mapping is another thing, um, but once you start um, abusing it a little bit, um, let's see here, I'm showing off the actual, uh, this is the vertex shader being edited, wait. Yeah, so here it's just to, illustrate how you can, right, it's just to illustrate sort of the, the environment itself. So at the bottom uh, right, you see all the errors are actually coming out as you type in the fragment shader, and the things are not actually acting out the way you want. And I forget exactly what I'm showing off in this particular demo, so I'll just skip to the next slide. <laughs> the geometric possibilities, right, so this is the point where you can start abusing fragments for interesting things. So you can actually make shapes like these, you can decide to make circles on a surface of your shapes in your 3D space. So there's a lot of things you can start doing. You can even mix 2D and 3D at that point when you start knowing what you, you know, uh, when, once you start experimenting with it. Uh, there's interesting things like this example here. Some people at Valve, uh, this is a, an old paper from 2007, they managed to basically create 2D textures that act as SVGs. So how did they do that? They use distance fields. So you see they took a high-res texture at the 4K by 4K, and they turned it into a 64 by 64 distance field, and that allowed them to create a texture, a mono <coughs> monochrome texture, though, I have to be said. That if you look at it from very far away, it's going to look good, and if you look at it from very close, it's going to approximate the behavior in SVG. So the idea here is that your fragment shader can look at how far am I from that pixel, like, right? So the idea is that for any given pixel, it looks up the texture map, which is actually a distance map, and it knows exactly how far it is from the inside or the outside of the letter. So that allows it to, uh, you know, become, well, that allows basically this effect. And they, this is not a very complex thing to implement. You can start thinking about 
different approaches that could be interesting that way. Uh, another trick to know about fragment shaders is that you can do full screen rendering with fragment shaders, which might seem a bit odd, but it's actually possible if you fill your screen with triangles and you let the fragment shaders do all the work, you can get into results that look a bit like this. So it's a bit long to explain how ray marching works and all these nice niceties right here. But I recommend you go and check out Shader Toy. You can actually, if you have your laptop open, open it right now. What you're going to see is that a lot of these programs, first they're animated. That's the one thing that this slide doesn't really give you. But you can write very interesting scenes with very, very little code. So here I'm actually showing screens of something called the two tweet contest. So these are fragment shaders that fit within two tweets. And this is the kind of things you can get up to. Like you can notice there's like a lot of fractals in here. There's like fireballs, there's uh, mountain ranges, etc. So these are actually all tricks that you can very much apply in VR and that the little framework that we just showed allows you to basically copy and paste into your example code. So go check out Shader Toy if you're curious to see like the full potential of, of what can be done. Uh, I have a little part here about model creation. I'm going to try a bit, go a bit quickly. So one of the big motivations behind my exploration of this VR is that I, and you know, the Java part of it, is that I, you might be aware that any given game has a lot of production value behind it, right? If you take something like an Assassin's Creed game, I believe you're going to have four or 500 employees and a budget of the hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So there's a lot of people making these meshes and these really complex architectures, and, right? So how can a developer like us, an app developer, get to anything compelling that would be an interesting sort of game or an interesting thing to explore in VR? So procedural content generation is the thing, right? We see a few examples here. We see Minecraft. Earlier examples are NetHack. If you know what that is, then you're probably as old as me. But very fun game. Like you can make a lot of compelling content just using procedural generation techniques. So I have a very simple landscape example here I'm going to show you. Uh, using the same environment as we did before. So all you basically need to generate a landscape, uh, I'm using sort of the Minecraft method here, is you need a source of noise. Uh, typically people use Perlin noise. Anyway, it's one of the noise, the source of noises you can use. So what I did is I went and got a JavaScript implementation of a Perlin noise generator. I created a grid, a flat grid of cubes in space which is basically these uh, six or seven lines of code right here, just a for loop, right? A couple of for loops, creating those shapes, feeding those shapes into the, sh into, the, into the framework. And you only need to apply the source of noise to the height of the cube, and you have a landscape. So you can mess about. And all this, again, is light, right? So this allows you to experiment. This allows you to go see an article that's a bit more theoretical and not invest hours upon hours of work to actually see the results. Also, it, you know, there's enough, I think the, a tight refresh cycle is actually ideal for learning anything, in my personal opinion. And uh, at the bottom here, you can actually see, if you're curious, the actual build going on every time I hit save. So it's not a, this, right now, is not part of the, um, the sample code. I'm going to put most of the build scripts into the repo a bit later today or tomorrow. I haven't done it so far because my credentials for Firebase are in there, and I didn't want to share them. So that's the only real reason. Uh, all right, so how much time do we have? A few minutes? Three minutes? Good. That's just enough to talk about VR challenges. So we're going to get more into like big picture land right now. Uh, so VR has a really interesting series of challenges. Um, you might kind of see where I'm going with uh, here. So if you have no hands, you can't manipulate anything, right? So that's why cardboard only has one clicker. So you're limited in many ways. That can be definitely a drawback. Uh, right, it's kind of interesting. Okay, you get the button sometimes because not all cardboard viewers actually have a button. Sometimes it's kind of flaky, and your head position is the pointer. So that's interesting. So if you look at the cardboard manufacturer specs, a button is not even an absolute requirement. You can definitely have cardboard devices that don't have buttons. It's supported by the SDK. It can still be interesting, but it's fairly limited at that point. So. Oculus Gear, you might be interested to, to if you haven't seen it, uh, allows you to basically sidestep all of this because they have a strap that, you know, you put your headset on and you have a touchpad on the side. So that's one way, for example, to get rid of a lot of the problems. Right. Um, tilt to exit. So the idea here is that, you know, 
once you have creative constraints, you can sort of play around with them. So tilt to exit is a nice interaction. If you've played around with cardboard, you've probably seen that tilting is escape, right? It's the back button. So you can sort of think of interactions like these. Uh, head tracking, so it's actually a very, very rich source of input. Um, you don't get to know really 100% where exactly people are looking at, though, because you might be looking in this direction, but your eyes might be looking that way, right? So that's something to take into consideration. I actually know of startups that have been financed just on the idea of trying to monetize where people look in VR and just like provide heat maps. So you, know, you can think of different opportunities right there. Immersive audio is very powerful in the VR environments, but if you think about end users in the app store, it's not everybody that's actually going to try your app with headsets, right? It has to be already a pretty compelling experience for somebody to actually put the effort into plugging into the, the headphone jack and actually trying it out with the, uh, with the, the, the headset. So uh, some of the big pitfalls, uh, you need to think about centering and drift. Uh, cardboard tends to drift a good bit, which leads to what I call the meat space sofa twist. So you're sitting on a sofa, it starts drifting, and suddenly the front of the game is that away, and you're like this. So it's not all that great. Uh, so if you're, a, if you're a developer of apps for VR, try to think about providing ways to reset and recenter your scene for the users. That's kind of important. If the user is sitting in a swivel chair, maybe they're more mobile. That could be interesting. But how do you actually know, right? So you kind of have to design these things in or have very strong tutorials in your app. And we know that tutorials lead to friction, which can lead to drop off. So there's definitely a lot of things to think about if you want to make a compelling VR experience for an end user. Standing up with a cardboard, uh, so the reflex to move is really ingrained. Every time I've tried VR so far and I'm standing up, I want to walk places. At least the good news is it's cardboard, so your hands are here. You're gonna, not going to smack people around by accident. Uh, so uh, for those of you that have tried the HTC Vive or have seen what it looks like, there's a lot of food for thought there because in those environments with those two things that you're holding up, I can guarantee you that you're going to be flailing around a lot, even if there's other people in the room. You're going to forget they're there. So somebody's going to get hurt. Uh, anyway, just a lot of things to think about. So guided experiences are actually a very quick, uh, very cool thing. Um, over your he ear headphones equals no distraction. So if somebody has seen a uh, field trip or the Google expeditions, right, they play around with that a lot where the kids have the headsets. So they hear the others a lot less. They get the cardboard, they put it to their face. So when they're immersed, the teachers can actually talk through the headset because they have microphones that redirect sound. So that allows sort of the classroom to focus on what's going on in the VR space. And it also allows the teacher to say, okay, now take off the headset. And then everybody sort of goes back to reality. For, so when you have guided experiences like that, that can be very powerful. Um, Cardboard is kind of cool for getting back to reality. Since you have no straps, you can easily take it off. You can easily just go this way. Whereas if you have a worn headset, that's kind of tough to get out of. So again, that's something you need to think of when you're designing your app or your game or whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, scripting, so Windy Day, uh, if you've tried it out, is the little mouse demo that's running after a hat. So in that specific example, what they did to make it more powerful is that they don't trigger a scene unless somebody looks at it. So. A lot of challenges to think about when you're designing a VR app and a lot of different things. The best thing, obviously, is to try it and, and user test it, and et cetera. So uh, time for an upgrade. These are different headsets that you can actually get right now that are Android-based. Uh, one of them that's kind of interesting and that's kind of new that's really not showing up very nice on this slide is called the Ion VR. They were a big barbecue uh, sponsor in Texas, and they had a 3D printed model. It's a Kickstarter. It's going to come out in a few months. I definitely recommend you check that out because they have extra motion sensors uh, that are going to be part of the package, which are going to be open sourced in the sense that the APIs are going to be open sourced to use that. Oculus Gear is actually uh, pretty good. I've tried that out. It's one of the better ones out there. The touch interface is really cool. There's going to be specific games designed for it. Uh, it's very easy to think of adapting a cardboard SDK app to that environment. Um, because it's basically just an extra touch uh, input uh, item in there. The Homido is sort of the better one if you don't want to go into the Samsung universe. Uh, so it, it, it has really nice adjustments. It's a very nice quality headset. They also sell a Bluetooth remote with it, so you can actually control your game. 
OSVR is something you want to check out. It's uh, an open source alliance to do VR. They have both desktop based and Android based ideas at this moment. It's a company called Razer that makes peripherals that's behind it. Uh, other thing to think about, you can use Android Wear as an input device. So this is probably going to be something I'm going to be adding into the demo talk, uh, the, the, the code for the talk at some point. I have that ready in a repo, but I haven't bothered with it. But the idea is that basically you can use your Android Wear as a touch input and just feed that into your app. It's a very direct connection. Latency is fairly low, so you can make very nice interactions this way. And then uh, last big recommendation, if you're going to get into this market, get creative. Uh, the thing to think about that I repeat a lot to people is that if you think about all the equipment that you could upsell a user if they're trying you know, your app. So they're trying your game with a cheap old little cardboard setup. You could sell them a different headset if you wanted to. And if you sell actual physical goods in the store, I'd just like to remind everybody, you're not going to pay the 30% tax, right? You don't have to give 30% to Google if you're selling actual hardware. So if you start thinking of it that way, you could almost make a business model out of letting people try your game for free and just basically telling them, look, you'd have such a better experience if you bought so-and-so's headsets, so-and-so's. So you can actually find different ways of monetizing your app that way and getting a lot of traction. So there's a lot of different things. If you start being creative, that you could explore to make money out of all this virtual stuff. And that's it for me. Um, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate the chance to speak. Uh, are there any, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'll, we'll see. Yes. Yeah. What's the VNC what? software for? Uh, so Visor with a Y. Can you repeat the question in the microphone? Oh, yeah. so the What's the VNC software for Android that you use again? Yes. So uh, the, the software in question is called Visor. It's uh, by a developer that's, uh, by, you probably know of Kush. Uh, so it's actually a Chrome extension. Uh, so just look for Visor with a Y in the Chrome extension store, and you're going to find that. Uh, right now, it's obviously not connected, but it's it's a very nice tool for those rare moments where Jenny Motion is not uh, <laughs> available for use, basically. Uh, v Y S. Oh, okay, yeah. So, oh, sorry. Uh, I'll I'll just pop that up. Yep. Like this. Visor first link right here. Uh, anything else? <laughs> yeah, the people behind Clockwork Mods. Um, yeah. Yeah. So on, on your pipeline, I didn't quite um, wait, wait for the micro. It's not for the people, it's for the camera. Okay. Yeah, okay. So on your, on your pipeline again, one question. I didn't um, quite get this set up. Maybe you could briefly go over that again like you have a you run it in a browser then you push it to firebase right. and then the the yeah. tool chain so i can actually show that off uh, very quickly i think uh, so i have my intellij uh, instance here so what's happening is that i am wait i'll just set it up with the proper time oh i just got an intellij crash i apologize <laughs> let's get that back up quickly so the idea is that intellij is actually just building a node project. So it's, there's a node project with the file structure you'd expect. There's Gulp as a build engine that's actually actively looking at any file that's changing in there and is going to rebuild the, uh, the full script. And I also use another piece that's called Browserify. And that piece is what takes a node program and turns it into something that can be executed in a browser, thus a web view. So that, that part, what I then do when I have that script is I upload it to Firebase and my Android viewer is registered as a subscriber with Firebase listening in on that shader, uh, not that shader, sorry, that JavaScript changing, right? So whenever the JavaScript is updated, whenever I hit save, the build triggers, it pushes to Firebase, all the remotes that are subscribed to that change will receive the script, then I run it in an invisible web view in my app, right? And then as of, when I execute the JavaScript, the output is my geometry. And then I take that and I feed that into the pipeline. So that's, that's the full loop, right? And it's, uh, I, I did not put that in the slides, but since you asked, uh, I'll just show you very quickly 
hopefully there's no credentials in there. <laughs> oh, it's sorry there. Oh, I'll hide it. Uh, all right, I'll just remove the credentials very quickly. All right, but well, anyway, I don't. Oh, yeah, sorry. Of course, you don't see it. There we go. It's going to work a bit better. All right. Okay, so I'm showing it on screen right now. The part for Firebase at the bottom is actually very small. There's about 10 lines here that are involved in just shipping the results of the build over. Everything else is pretty much standard beginner's project for Gulp. So if you go see the Gulp main pages, they're going to explain how to... I'm going to put this public, like this, the actual template script in the main project. Uh, so you're, you can also go and see there how I've done it. But it's a fairly standard JavaScript setup. Like from what I understand, uh, nothing very fancy. And it's not very long. So yeah, uh, that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, well, all right. Is there uh, any other question? Feel free to come and talk to me after. Obviously, I love to talk about this stuff, so you won't get me to shut up. <laughs> all right. Thanks again. <laughs>